uh, a nuance to the region, that there is no one size fits all solutions that could possibly solve the issues that we're discussing. And the other thing that I'm very pleased with is that we're getting beyond the normal discussions. We're getting beyond the easy solutions. Um, I once passed a church in Savannah, Georgia that had an interesting sign that said, heavy answers questioned here. And I think that's what we're getting to today, hopefully, is that there are no answers that, have, that remain unexplored. Um, our discussion is going to focus on security, and security means more than bombs and missiles and armies. It also means a person's sense of well-being, which embraces a lot more. Um, our moderator for this session is Dr. Michael Kasich, who is a professor of political science at Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, he's also director of the honors program there. He is a, a Fulbright scholar. Not only does he have a, a, a PhD, but he also has a JD, which sometimes comes in handy, I think, in panel discussions. Um, his specialty is on uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons um, nonproliferation. And with that, I'd like to turn over the microphone to, uh, to Dr. Kasich. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, one of my mandates here is to get this thing back on track, so I'll try to move quickly. I think that was an excellent panel on, on politics, uh, uh, a lot of food for thought and, and some interesting uh, uh, theoretical uh, points of view. Um, to misquote Clausewitz, security is uh, an, an extension of politics. Uh, it exists at one end of the political spectrum. Uh, whether it be the Palestinian question, or the Arab Spring, uh, both of which are political issues with very important security elements, uh, or nuclear nonproliferation, which is often viewed as a security issue, uh, but I think it is a mistake uh, not to nest this issue within its political context. So we are, in essence, uh, moving down the, the, the political spectrum, down the, the line, uh, to discuss some of the more specific security issues. Uh, we've asked our speakers to comment on the recent history of security issues in the Middle East, uh, key contemporary uh, security threats, including non-traditional issues, uh, how these threats relate to the larger political context, and finally, perhaps comment on future security threats in the region. Uh, we're lucky today to have three outstanding panelists uh, all with a history at the Middle East Institute. So our panel is weighted a little bit uh, in favor of the Middle East Institute today. Roby Barrett is the president of Stratplan International and currently a senior fellow with the Strategic Studies Department of the Joint Special Operations University of U.S. Special Forces Command. He's a former foreign service officer in the Middle East. His assignments have included Tunisia, Yemen, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Arabian Gulf. Dr. Barrett has an upcoming book entitled Securing the Gulf, which is slated for release in early 2013, and also a second book, The American Mission, an intellectual history of 20th century U.S. foreign policy in the developing world from 1945 to present. This is scheduled for publication in 19, uh, 2014. Uh, Dr. Barrett has a PhD from the uh, uh, University of Texas. Uh, Marvin Weinbaum is a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He's previously, previously served as an analyst for Pakistan and Afghanistan in the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Intelligence and Research from 1999 to 2003. Uh, my foreign policy students will tell you that I often comment on state's uh, Bureau of Intelligence and Research and what quality work they do. Uh, he's currently a scholar in residence at the Middle East Institute uh, in Washington, D.C. He is the author or editor of six books and over 100 journal articles and book chapters. His PhD is from Columbia University. And Michael Ryan, last but certainly not least, is an adjunct scholar at the Middle East Institute, as well as a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation. Uh, President George W. Bush appointed Dr. Ryan vice president of the Millennium Challenge Corporation in 2006, where he served until 2008. Uh, he has held senior positions in the Department of State, Defense, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. His Ph.D. is from Harvard University, and he also has a book coming out uh, shortly at Columbia University Press, scheduled for an August release. It's entitled Decoding Al-Qaeda Strategy, The Deep Battle Against America. Uh, gentlemen, with that, I will turn comments over to you.
thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's always good to get to stay close to home for uh, one of these conferences rather than traveling around the world. What I want to do here is one of the guidelines laid out was try to set the uh, stage for where we are now and you know rather than go back two or three centuries I think I'll start with 2001 and I'll talk about the situation as it developed after 9-11 and not so much what U.S. policy intended but rather what the reaction to U.S. policy and the perceptions of it were say in that 10-year period in that decade since 2001 and then I'm going to talk about the current situation and I'm going to talk about the future a little bit. First, I'm going to quote a senior pro-Western Arab military officer who in a private conversation to me in 2009 said, the last eight years have been little short of a disaster for U.S. interests in the region, raised questions about U.S. reliability among its allies. U.S. has been deaf to advice and blind to its strategic interests. Pretty harsh criticism coming from a guy that's educated by us and that is very, very pro-Western. So let's, let's look at what he's talking about. In the Gulf, U.S. policy achieved for Iran a series of long-term security goals that had eluded Persia and Iran since the 18th century, 250 years. Iran fought a war with Iraq for eight years with millions of casualties, and it had five goals. Goal one, remove Iraq as a threat or a block to the Islamic Republic and the spread of, uh, of Iran's influence in the region. Number two, personally to remove Saddam Hussein. Number three, the destruction of secular Sunni Ba'athist Iraq and its replacement by Islamic, uh, a more sectarian regime. Number four, and this was kind of out there on the goals, it was an improved political situation for the Shia of Iraq and improved uh, Iranian influence with them. And their blue sky, totally unexpected goal, was to actually have direct influence and political power in Baghdad. We achieved every one of those goals for Tehran in six weeks in 2003. They even got a bonus out of, the, out of the situation. Who cooperated with us probably more than anyone else in the destruction of the Taliban regime in, uh, in Afghanistan? The Iranians were right there with us, handing us intelligence. They had better intelligence than we did, and supporting our efforts wholeheartedly because they viewed that regime in Afghanistan as a mortal threat to their uh, sovereignty, particularly in the eastern areas of Iran. We worked very closely and very quietly with them to use their information to make sure that we destroy that regime. And as a result, for the first time since the Safavid Empire of the 18th century, the Iranians have enormous influence in Western Afghanistan where they've traditionally had a large Shia minority and even more economic influence because they've tied those areas of Western Afghanistan through electricity, through various uh, other uh, economic incentives to the Iranian Republic. Second issue. When we talk about axes of evil and start naming names, okay, and then get yourself bogged down in two military quagmires that totally undermine your credibility as being able to do anything about it, it tends to hurt your status in the region. The international credibility issue over Iraq cost us dearly. Uh, Wilsonian platitudes how shall I say this? Wilsonian platitudes about democracy and pressure, to, and pressure on regimes to liberalize and in the face of increasingly radical threats and then debacles like forcing or strongly pressuring everyone to have an election in the Palestinian territories in 2006 
and with everyone advising us not to, the Israelis, the, uh, the Palestinian Authority, the Saudis, you can go down the list, too many people to name here. And we go ahead and pressure that, and then the election turns out that Hamas gets elected, and we refuse to recognize Hamas, and we cut off all the funding, although we were supporting democracy, right? Uh, in other words, leads people to conclude in the region that we support democracy as long as you elect people we think you ought to elect. And if you don't elect people we think you ought to elect, we're going to cut you off. My position on that is, hey, if you're going to insist on election and you don't know the outcome, maybe you shouldn't insist on democracy. It's a far better to have not had the election than to look so hypocritical in the face of the rest of the region. We have, at the end of this period, uh, at the end of this decade, Hezbollah was by far the most powerful, most cohesive uh, political and military force in Lebanon, despite all of the money that we spent on the various parties of trying to turn Lebanon into a state. Well, perhaps, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, perhaps in our traditional conception of a state, Lebanon is not a state. Maybe, and, and we'll talk about that as we apply it to other places. Uh, lack of progress on Palestinian uh, statehood. It is really in vogue and has been in vogue to kick that can down the road to borrow a phrase, okay? Uh, bottom line is, to minimize the impact that that has ideologically and the tool that it provides our enemies, those people working against our interests in the region, uh, in our discussions or in our policy is a mistake. This idea that no one really cares about what happens to the Palestinians is, is nonsense. People care, and beyond that, whether they care or not, it provides a very, very powerful tool for our enemies to use not only on ourselves, but on our allies in the region. Uh, to quote Ambassador Oteba, the ambassador from the UAE, who is virulently anti-Iranian, he once said, he said, you know, you go out of your way to make it difficult for us because of your policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Uh, Abu Ghraib, Gitmo, I could go down the list. Uh, Americanizing wars, when you put main force units into wars, whether they're in Iraq or whether they're in Afghanistan, you are going to have problems. There are going to be instances where somebody goes berserk and kills a bunch of innocent people, okay? Because those units weren't designed, they aren't motivated, their mantra is not to fight wars where you're not going from point A to point B and trying to win in some conventional sense. The word W-I-N does not exist in the world we're dealing with out there, the conventional. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to preserve equilibriums. And so you add all of that together and you come back with a series of propaganda disasters that end up being a recruiting poster for your enemies. Palestine, Gitmo, you see what I'm saying? So no amount of public diplomacy is going to correct that in people's minds. It's just too difficult. Uh, we won't even talk about, and this is, a, I, this is a surprisingly hot topic among the US military, we won't even talk about the refusal of the United States population as a whole and certain political groups in, in particular to pay for wars. You don't fight two major <coughs> wars and not pay for them. Okay, because when you do that, you end up in a, in a position where you're far weaker, you have far less capability to be able to pursue what you may determine is a necessary war in the future because you're broke. Then we'll talk about Al-Qaeda a little bit. Now, Michael's going to talk about this a lot, um, but here's my view of it. We really got hit hard on 9-11, right? The United States. But if our security services 
had functioned as it should have, and somebody had thought it was suspicious that a guy was trying to learn to fly an airplane but didn't learn, care whether he could land or take off in it, right? You hear what I'm saying? It's not that these guys were geniuses or they had some big command and control structure that was, that was diabolical and they could get around it. It's just that we were worse than they were in the job we were supposed to do, right? And so what happened after that politically, you have no choice but to conflate your uh, opposition. This is, this is a, uh, if, if someone really pulls something like that off, then you have to turn him into something that almost sounds like this scary Superman that's hiding behind every bush. It reminds me of the 50s and the rhetoric of the Cold War and communists. It's, it's, the, it's the Cold War mantra that the US population already knew. You could sell it to them. And so what you do is you conflate Al Qaeda into some sort of this mass Islamic thing that's going to get us. And we react to it in the same way. But you know what that ends up doing because of the media, the lack of granularity and being able to look and understand the problems uh, or understand who the organization is, it makes Al Qaeda a brand name. If you were, if you were pushing Al Qaeda, okay, and uh, if you were forming a violent extremist organization, we call them now, Al Qaeda would be, Al Qaeda would be the uh, uh, name you would pick for the front of it. So, so in a way, we became their publicist. 2009, we've done a lot better. We've looked at, uh, uh, belatedly, we, we've decided Afghanistan, we're going to withdraw from Afghanistan. We got out of Iraq. Um, there's been some regional improvement, but we only got out of Af Afghanistan after another surge, and we won't have much to show for it. You could put 500,000 troops in Afghanistan for 50 years, and when you withdrew them, it'd still be Afghanistan. Um, military option has proven marginally effective. Americanizing the conflicts costs too much, creates too many problems. I have what I talk about as tack hammers over sledgehammers. These wars we're fighting are special ops wars. They're for, they're for very elite, very well indoctrinated, better educated troops that aren't that understand that what they're about is perhaps not winning in a conventional sense, but making sure the other guy doesn't win. Creating an e equilibrium that people are not particularly happy about, but are better than, than uh, has a better chance of producing something that we can live with. Political symbolism is important. That's something else we've learned. Killing bin Laden was important. I, I really believe that. And that's because you don't, as president of the United States, you don't say we're going to get the guy and 10 years later he's still running around thumbing his nose at you. Okay? Slogans, simplistic slogans like global war on terror, thank goodness we've gotten rid of all of that. We've even gone back to referring to the radical organizations as VEOs, violent extremist organizations, not even Al Qaeda, because Al Qaeda has regional and local roots now, the people calling themselves Al-Qaeda. It's just the brand name that they're using. They could call themselves something else. It's almost always, to a significant degree, motivated by local and regional issues. Um, so, so what does that mean for security in the future? I will tell you that the monarchies in the region, particularly in the Gulf, and the Gulf security system that we inherited from the British that's 250 years old, it's simply our most important security priority in the region. And those monarchies have been more stable and have better records of human rights than any of the other republics in the region. I'll compare any of them to Syria, Iraq, Yemen. I can go down the list, okay? The republics all have stability issues. They all tend to authoritarian approaches, and the new republics will too. Morsi will have to become more authoritarian or Morsi will not be there come the next election. Of the non-Gulf states, Egypt is by far our highest priority and the most important state in the region. Long term, I believe Egypt will move away from the letter of the law of the treaty with Israel and I believe that it will probably be in both Israel and Egypt's interest not to make a big deal out of it. We'll see. They may even, at some point, due to internal political pressure, abrogate that treaty. Yemen, Syria, Libya, Iraq, go down the list. 
Are those really national states when we're talking about them? Or are they conglomerations that have always been dominated by a majority that's managed to put, managed to hold power over the rest of them, literally by force and security apparatus? I do not believe that those fit the definition of national state. And I would recommend that you read this book by Benedict Anderson called Imagine Communities on, uh, on the national state and on nationalism. South Asia, is Pakistan a national state? You think about it. There are those that argue that from the beginning it was an artificial creation, that it never should have existed. Well, most of those people are Indian, but some are Pakistani as well. <laughs> Afghanistan, Afghanistan's not a state, will not be a state. It will function in an equilibrium. And our role there in the post-withdrawal period is merely to tip that equilibrium when we think it's getting out of hand. We learn not to let a Taliban regime uh, come back to power. Israel, politically paralyzed. Can't move forward on the things most important to it, can't move backward. Uh, increasingly isolated in the region. Uh, I believe, over long term, a strategically deteriorating position. Uh, in confrontations in the region, for example, little value added. Certainly there's a huge political downside for too close a cooperation. And to cooperate militarily, even if you share the exact same interests, uh, it's, political, it's political poison. And then capability, when you look at capability, one of the reasons that we're getting so much pressure right now from the Netanyahu government is because they know he's got every one of his security chiefs, he's got every one of his military chiefs telling him we can't get it done. If he could have taken out the Iranian things, they would have done it last week. Okay, Iran. First and foremost, Iran is not an irrational, messianic, apocalyptic state wanting a bomb. That is nonsense. The chief of staff of the IDF said point blank a few months ago, quoted in a, in a, in a study I just completed, that the leadership in Iran is not irrational. It's great to have Ahmadinejad and his empty headedness to stand <coughs> up in front of people and talk about, but he's not running the place. It's Guardian Council, it's Hamenei, and it's the IRGC. Okay? So I really think that uh, when we look at this whole issue of war with Iran, we need to think about it in terms of it not being an inconsequential undertaking. It is going to cost more, it's going to take longer, and the severity of the impact on the economies is going to be far more than anybody recognizes. And I don't think it will dissuade them. Here's the problem. The Iranians believe they have certain interests, and we have reinforced those beliefs over the things that we have handed them in the last 10 years. We've handed them around. They had occupied Baghdad since 1638. And so what I'm telling you is that the Iranians are kind of riding a wave of hubris, and that wave may lead to a cataclysm. Because it's not that they're, they're, they're irrational, it is that their interests run directly counter to our interests, our allies in the Gulf, Israel's interests, and what the West in general sees as the best solution for the region. It's not about sanity, it's about interest. Um, Yemen, fractured, little security. We may have a, uh, we may have a uh, uh, security cat cataclysm if they run out of water. Uh, we'll go, we're gonna play whack-a-mole, chasing the guys, uh, chasing bad guys in Yemen and these uncontrolled areas. That's what, that's what special ops is for. Um, Afghanistan, it's gonna be very similar to Yemen. Pakistan, uh, I see in the short term instability and in the long term more instability. Uh, Iraq, if they ever get their act together, they will be a problem for their neighbors. Iraq, every, every government in Iraq since 1920 has threatened Kuwait because Kuwait is in Iraq bottle, is the pork in Iraq's bottle. Look at a map. Uh, here's what I think. 
We're gonna, we've got the bigger issues of Iran that we have to deal with and have to decide what to do. I personally don't think anything short of, and I don't mean regime change, any Iranian you go to believes they have the right to have a nuclear program and do what they want to with it. I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about uh, the reality that to do in the nuclear program, we would have to do to Iran what we did to Iraq. Dismember it along ethnic whatever lines, and that is a high risk proposition. So, we're going to muddle through. Uh, I don't see a big new age dawning. I see it being the way it's always been, waiting on the next problem to deal with. We are going to, we are going to play whack-a-mole with the various groups that we think need to be hit. We'll hit them. Uh, we are going to, uh, while we're doing that, we'll try to manage our way through the bigger issues. And in the end, uh, hopefully, we can preserve things like the relationship with Egypt. We can see some progress on the Palestinian issue just to remove an irritant. And we will preserve what I call the Gulf security system, which is simply the most key thing to our own security and global security. And that is the, uh, uh, in the Gulf, the Arab states of the Gulf. And if that means, in the case of Bahrain, uh, Tom raised this, in the case of Bahrain, if that means we have to look the other way while the El Halifa and the Saudis take care of a problem, um, then pragmatically I think we have to do that. Thank you. You know, we, we just went through the tour to horizon here, and I feel like I'm going to be letting you down by now giving you a more of a microcosm in one sense, but a broader approach in, in another than is usual. Because I'm going to talk about a country which has just been mentioned here briefly, uh, uh, but I think is, is rather critical to what I'll refer to as the greater Middle East, and that's, of course, Pakistan. Uh, I don't think that we can uh, ignore the fact. By the way, it's interesting that the three of us, of course, have the uh, connection with the Middle East Institute. <clears throat> and when the Middle East Institute was formed, it came to be into being in 1946. It included Afghanistan and Pakistan as part of the greater Middle East. Well, either it was foresight or imperialism, uh, intellectual imperialism, whatever. Uh, it, they were, obviously, they were proven correct here in making that kind of definition. Well, <clears throat> the relationship that I want to talk about, particularly in linking the two, is that between two countries in this greater Middle East, of course, Pakistan, but also Saudi Arabia. One, because uh, of its pivotal position uh, in determining, above all, of other reasons, uh, world oil markets, Saudi Arabia, and the other because it's a nuclear-armed country that also happens to be, as is generally perceived, the epicenter of those, yes, terrorist groups with global ambitions. <clears throat> For both reasons, the United States, I think, has a high stake in what happens in those two countries. And we've heard a great deal about internal issues in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, what happens in those countries and the relationship between them as well. Because what we find is that that relationship between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan is built on economic, military, and spiritual ties, but all driven by geopolitics. These interests, however, do not always coincide, uh, coincide. And in fact, as I'll try to show you, they've ebbed and flowed depending on the dynamics of international and regional politics and developments within those two countries. So let's look first at the strategic interests here. Saudi Arabia has, for, for decades, figured prominently in Pakistan's calculation. <clears throat> Since the 1970s, 
Pakistan has tried to redefine its geostrategic position. Most people would say, well, Pakistan is part of South Asia. But South Asia was a losing cause for Pakistan for almost from the very beginning. Therefore, and it occurred mainly in, when, when uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was in power in Pakistan, that he said, we need some strategic depth here. And for him, strategic depth was creating links here to the Arab Middle East. And uh, <clears throat> the, to do so as a way of counterweight, a counterweight against India, so that Pakistan would not be in a, in, in a secondary position because it would have at its back the rest of the, much of the rest of the Muslim world. For three decades, the two countries uh, were aligned closely with the United States because they both uh, were part of our Cold War uh, strategy. Uh, the high point of this, of course, was in the 1980s when Saudi Arabia joined with the United States in bankrolling the Afghan Mujahideen a Mujahideen that operated under the wing of Pakistan's military. Pakistan and uh, Saudi Arabia were close allies in supporting, at least initially, the Afghan Taliban in the 1990s. <coughs> and in that case, their interests coincided because for Saudi Arabia, it meant as a means to contain Iranian influence and for Pakistan, a way of creating in Afghanistan a compliant state, again with the goal in mind here to have a nearby strategic depth uh, by having a friendly Afghanistan. Saudi Arabia can't help but look at Pakistan. And let me say in this regard that in Pakistan today, uh, Saudi Arabia looms quite large, bulks large, in the thinking of Pakistanis, and for reasons that I'll, uh, I'll be touching on here. But this is asymmetrical. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan does not have that kind of salience. But having said that, Pakistan does have to look at, at Pakistan with its 180 million people, a large professional army, a stockpile of between 125 and 150 nuclear weapons, perhaps. Uh, they have to look at Pakistan as an asset. Uh, and this goes back even in, the, in 1980 when, when uh, uh, Crown Prince Fahd declared that his country's security was tied up with Pakistan. So it's not a new notion. That's grown stronger since uh, Pakistan has become a nuclear power but also important because throughout this period, Pakistan was to play a rather significant role as providing a gendarmerie for Saudi Arabia in its own efforts to fashion the Gulf region to its liking and to maintain stability in its own country. Uh, beginning in the 1960s, the kingdom had uh, <laughs> begun to send members of its military to Pakistan for training. Uh, and a small number of uh, military officers were sent from Pakistan, supposedly retired, to Saudi Arabia to build its army and air force. They, just, they signed a defense pact in 1967 and included a personal guard for the royal family. In 69, when they were in a conflict with Yemen, aircraft that were, that were available to the kingdom were flown by Pakistani pilots. Uh, in the well-known siege of Mecca's Grand Mosque in 1979, 
Pakistani forces were instrumental in, uh, in con containing it and then uh, ultimately uh, reversing uh, that, uh, that insurgency. Uh, just more recently, we've heard about the intervention in, in Bahrain. And while, while it was true that in that intervention, while it was true in that in intervention, if Pakistanis were not involved, my information is that Pakistanis were held uh, in reserve in case they were needed, so that they remain here a, 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 a force to be seen as, as available. Now, they haven't always been on the same page. Uh, in the Iran-Iraq war, the Zia regime refused to be drawn into the conflict, uh, despite pressure from Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, to, to back Iraq. Uh, now, it wanted to please its Saudi benefactors, uh, but also felt more, more important that it maintain a normal relationship with its Western Shia neighbor, Iran. Pakistan can ill afford to have a hostile Western border, not when it faces on its south and eastern borders, uh, India. There have been disappointments in the relationship on the Pakistan side as well. Uh, Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia has never been defined as China is as the all-weather friend. Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries uh, did not, have not figured in Pakistan's wars with India, uh, much to the chagrin of the Pakistan leadership, who always expected that as Muslim countries they would back them, and the disappointment, of course, also included the United States, which refused to get involved in the 1971 war or in the 1965 war. Uh, and when we did become involved in 19, uh, uh, 99 in the Cargill affair, we, as far as they were concerned, got involved on the wrong side. <clears throat> Actually, Iran has been more supportive of Pakistan than Saudi Arabia when it's come to the Kashmir dispute. Uh, just recently, well, 2010, there were enormous floods in Pakistan, and the world community very generously provided funds Saudi Arabia gave $44 million, which relative to what everybody else was given was really quite, uh, uh, quite a paltry sum. Uh, in this case, it was a reflection of the fact of what they think about the current Pakistan government. And in that regard, let's, let's say that the Pakistanis have been involved, uh, sorry, the Saudis have been involved in Pakistan's politics. Uh, and in that sense, they've been more like the United States and less like China. Saudi Arabia has had its favorites over the years, mostly religious conservatives, people like General Zia and Nawaz Sharif. <clears throat> when there took place the coup in, two, in 1999, and Musharraf, General Musharraf imprisoned Nawaz Sharif, it was the Saudis who sprung him and brought him into exile in Saudi Arabia, brought him into exile in Saudi Arabia, and gave him a villa. The relationship between the two countries when it comes to the, when it comes to, between Pakistan and the United States is a transactional relationship. And that is you do this and we do that. That does not describe the way in which Saudi Arabia and Pakistan relate to one another. Uh, there is in Pakistan a unmistakable deference here to Saudi Arabia as the spiritual center of the Muslim world. And the Saudis have capitalized on this and used it, this sentiment, to employ soft power so that it has funded mosques and madrasas in in Pakistan as a way of both strengthening its own puritanical doctrinaire version of Islam, Wahhabiyya, and uh, at the same time also as a way of, as a way of, uh, excuse me for a moment here, 
uh, of curbing Iranian influence in the country. The Saudi involvement has had, however, unintended consequences, both for its own interests and for those of Pakistan. By funding those madrasas and mosques, they have reinforced the Diobandi teaching, which is Wahhabi-like, and bear much of the responsibility for the extremist mindset that now pervades Pakistan. Many of those madrasas and mosques serve to indoctrinate people for militancy and to foster recruitment to jihadi groups, including some groups which are today have turned on the Pakistan state. Those groups also, as it happens, have ties to Saudi Arabia, to, to the Al-Qaeda group, which targets both Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. But what most stands out in this relationship between the two countries is their economic dependency. The Saudis have not been pleased with Pakistan's mismanagement of its economy and has given uh, the, and the country's insatiable appetite for economic assistance. Pakistan has received more aid from Saudi Arabian government uh, than, uh, uh, than fra, uh, from any other source in the Middle East. It supported it by deferred payments for oil supplies uh, and for parking money in their banks. Uh, the remittances that come from Saudi Arabia, the workers who are, who are working in Saudi Arabia are critical to Pakistan's economy. But whatever the links between them today, most of the discussion takes place around the notion of an Islamic bomb. It was, it was Muammar Gaddafi who in the mid-70s, uh, with not disguising at all what he wanted, he was investing in Pakistan and the uh, creation of a nuclear weapons program. Uh, as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, a lot of attention is paid to the fact that in 1990, Prince Turkey uh, appeared in Pakistan to, ins to inspect its nuclear development. But there is no evidence that I'm aware of that the Saudis have ever bankrolled the nuclear program or that there exists any formal agreement or informal agreement on nuclear power sharing. <coughs> now, that doesn't mean that Saudi Arabia and other countries in the region don't take pride in Pakistan's nuclear arsenal, but it's about, but these countries are, are limited in, in the fact that they also value their relationship with India. But we can view, having said that, we can view the Pakistan bomb as perhaps an insurance policy. As Iran moves closer to becoming de facto nuclear power, perhaps sometime, the time is not far off, that Saudi Arabia may seek to cash in on its chips. As Pakistan's long-term economic and spirit benefit, economic benefactor and spiritual guide, uh, those chips are, are conceivably there. Uh, conceiv but, Pak but Saudi Arabia, to this point, has not forced Pakistan to make a choice, Iran or us. Uh, how could it be assistance? Well, this could, in the end, be a deterrent against the threatening Iran. Uh, it could also assist a Saudi program should they decide that they want to go ahead with their own nuclear program. Saudi Arabia provides, uh, <clears throat> at the, currently looking at the Iran and the potential of a Israeli attack, Saudi Arabia, uh, it is said, the leadership uh, privately uh, would welcome uh, an Israeli attack uh, which would hobble perhaps uh, Iran's nuclear program, at least set it back for a while, uh, <clears throat> though they would never, never publicly say so. Pakistan is not anxious to have a, uh, a neighbor, a nuclear armed neighbor, uh, but let me say that 
whatever the leadership in those countries may feel, uh, were there to be a strike, uh, you could be sure that both leaders will be among the very, leadership in both countries will be among the very first to condemn it. Uh, in both cases, their own publics would demand nothing less and their regime survival would be contingent upon it. Uh, today, Saudi Arabia, we think, uh, is capable of performing some kind of mediating role in bringing about a concili conciliation in Afghanistan. And there was, uh, a few years ago, an important meeting that took place uh, in which they uh, hosted members of the Taliban and also the uh, Pakistanis. Uh, and uh, it was with an effort here to bring about some grand bargain. Uh, nothing has come of that. But uh, there still is a feeling that Saudi Arabia can make a contribution uh, if and when the situation is uh, propitious for a, a settlement. It's not at any time soon. So let me conclude by saying that uh, Whatever the differences we've had with Pakistan and, and Saudi Arabia over their responsibilities for fostering radical militant Islam, the United States, above all, needs both these countries to remain stable. They hold the keys as much as any country in our ability to succeed against, sorry, Roby, global terrorism. Whatever our frustrations, mainly with Pakistan now, our policies have to contribute to Pakistan's stability. Both countries, and particularly here in Pakistan where it, the possibilities exist, uh, are badly in need of political reform. And the extent to which we can encourage that uh, in the right direction are certainly, that's part of something we ought to be working with. But, and let me say that unless, at least in Pakistan, there is some not, there is some progress towards political change, unless there is some progress, uh, a more cataclysmic change is probably down the road. But let's keep in mind here that any kind of radical change that we're looking at here, uh, this is true for both countries. Uh, the kind of change that we're likely to get is not one that's going to be one that the United States is going to look upon as a favorable development. So as we, as we seek change here, I think that is in, certainly in Pakistan and, 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 and Saudi Arabia as well, uh, what we're looking for here is an evolutionary change and not a, an abrupt, more radical change because uh, the consequences, as I say, for us would be rather catastrophic. Thank you. To say that I, I'm going to be talking today about um, Al-Qaeda, or and we'll see the, several different names, uh, and specifically their strategy, their internal uh, conversation with themselves. And I'm going to use terms uh, that I don't want you to ascribe to some political uh, view I have. I am translating the terms they use. So if I say savagery, it's a translation of their term in Arabic, tawahush. I'm not ascribing to them. If, if I use the term chaos, it's fauda. It's their term. And so everything that you get from me, is, is I, I've made every uh, attempt not to impose on them my opinions, but to try to give you a view of what they are like when they talk about themselves. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, we began uh, with, with Mr. Issa um, talking about the Ottoman Empire, which I, I thought was wonderful because I didn't have it in my speech, but uh, the Ottoman Empire is the, and the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and then a, a, a theory of the fall of empires and what happens when empires fall is the beginning point of one of the major strategists of Al Qaeda. And he talks about it and, and, and he uses uh, Paul Kennedy, and he uses other Western sources and his own, uh, his own to, to, to describe it. 
So that's not part of my 12 minutes. I just want to let you know that don't describe to me a political view. Uh, I'll tell you what my political views are. I'm trying to describe what Al-Qaeda theorists say when they're talking to themselves. And I'm going to go through a lot of this and a, a lot of uh, names that may be strange um, or unheard of. And uh, don't worry about the names. If you want the names, I can give them to you afterwards. But uh, unless you read Arabic, they're not going to help you very much anyway. Um, and these are all Arabic documents that I got on the internet, and you can find them there today. All right, today, so I would like to discuss the global jihadist strategy that got it al-Qaeda over the last decade, and in keeping with our agenda, its implications for threats to the United States in the coming decade. I use the term jihadist because al-Qaeda strategists usually refer to themselves as part of the jihadist movement, and often refer to their ideology as Salafist jihadism. At the outset, I emphasize that jihadism in this sense is related to the legitimate religious term jihad only in the sense that Salafist jihadists would like to usurp the traditional interpretation of jihad with a, a rather modern invention. And we can talk about that if we have time at great length. Uh, during the last decade, the Middle East and South Asia presented the United States with a series of security challenges that are distinctly different from previous decades after World War II, the United States, among its other interests, pursued a vigorous policy of securing and protecting regional energy resources. And until we are successful in becoming energy independent, this will continue to be a policy imperative. For the most part, threats came from state actors. The threat to American strategic interests emanated generally, as we all know, from Arab-Israeli wars, nuclear proliferation, and Cold War competition in a, in a general sense. After the 1979 Iranian Revolution, the multifaceted threat of a hostile Iran emerged, which of course continues today with Iran's quest for a nuclear weapon. In 1991, when a large American uh, force was first deployed in the Arabian Peninsula, again, it was response to a state, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and the implied threat to Saudi um, oil fields, to be straightforward. Even what we called international terrorism in previous decades generally had state support, if not sponsorship. The strategic surprise of the 9-11 attacks began to awaken the United States to an additional paradigm, sometimes referred to as fourth generation warfare. The borderless, asymmetric, and stateless war without any fronts. Although in hindsight, this change began with the attacks of our embassies in East Africa in 1998 and the USS Cole in 2000, or even the first attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. The story of Al-Qaeda's attacks and the American response is usually told in political terms, that's what we usually get, or in tactical context of military or intelligence operations, uh, sometimes referred to as the close battle. Today, though, I'd like to focus on what I call, uh, borrowing a term from, uh, from others, the deep battle, the ideological and strategic struggle behind the front page headlines and behind what we euphemistically call kinetic operations. Understanding the strategic deep battle with jihadists, understanding their ideology and strategy, gives us a basis for a counter-narrative that aims to avoid most religious traps, aims to avoid, and gives a better base for anticipating, if not predicting, future threats. I will begin the story in the middle, after the initial American counterstrike that responded to 9-11. Our modest first steps resulted in the overthrow of the Taliban government, of course, and the dispersal and initially serious weakening of Al-Qaeda. Nevertheless, the Afghan safe haven had already given jihadists the ability to plan and train for what was to become known as global jihad. What one Al-Qaeda strategist referred to as the global Islamic resistance. And this term resistance is, again, borrowed from uh, a left, leftist resistance, and it's not by accident. So resistance in Latin America, in this sense, would be very key to the use of their term here. Thus, after the counterstrike by America and its Afghan allies, Al-Qaeda's leadership realized that imminent death was a real possibility. And as a result, in 2001, Ayman al-Zawahiri, a man who's often been underestimated, by the way, began to write his legacy in a book called Knights Under the Prophet's Banner. Most of the book focused on Egypt, 
But along with his now infamous call to kill Jews and Americans, quote, in our countries, as Zawahiri issued a call to global jihad in a section he called the future of the jihadist movement. Moving along, following him next in 2002 and 2003, Abu Albaid al-Qurashi wrote articles in an online uh, journal in Arabic with titles, I'm, I'm translating, titles such as Al-Qaeda and the Art of War and Fourth Generation Warfare, where I began. Articles like these aim to convince young Arabic-speaking Muslim men that Al-Qaeda could defeat America, no matter how strong the United States seemed, because nobody believed it, of course, it believed it, of course, at the time, or even now. If the global community of Muslims united in a common struggle and adopted a winning strategy, those two things, the model was Mao's classic War of the Flea, in which the United States is the dog that the jihadist movement would kill with thousands of small wounds. And these would be inflicted, for the most part, as, as Zawahiri had advised, with a single bullet, or an iron bar, a knife, or a homemade bomb, or a devastating suicide attack. And he, 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 in his usual repetitive ways, he said, you know, it's not absurd to think you can kill an American with an iron bar. It's not absurd that you could kill him with a bullet. So if everybody just gets together, we can win. Indeed, Al-Qaeda and other strategists were to cite Mao, Mao Zedong, General Chiap, the Vietnamese general, Che Guevara, and other lesser known guerrilla strategists. Fourth generation warfare that I mentioned before had a different uh, uh, genealogy, an American genealogy. In, in a sense, the ideas began with Mao, but Al Qaeda strategists learned about it from a paper published in the Marine Corps Gazette in 1989. And they learned we weren't going to prepare for it, so they thought it was probably a pretty good idea for them. Fourth generation warfare aims at psychological defeat of the strong by the weak, which was a perfect fit for them. The psychological defeat of the strong by the weak. And in fact, they translate the 1965 book uh, called The War of the Flea by the left wing uh, writer Robert Tabor about experiences of left wing insurgencies in Latin America, which is called The, the War of the Flea. They translate it as the war of the weak, using a Quranic term for weak. And, and so when you try to find it, they use this book in Afghanistan to train people, thousands of people. It's an American book. Best book, they said, on, on, on insurgency was written by an American. Uh, next, and I'm just mentioning a few of these strategists, sorry for the names. Abdulaziz al Muqlin in his manual used in Saudi Arabia, a practical course for guerrilla wars in 2003, cites the war of the flea and wrote, and this is a quote, we must target and kill Jews and Christians to anyone who is an enemy of Allah and his prophets, we say, we have come to slaughter you. In today's circumstances, borders must not separate us. Again, in the Sykes-Picot era, after the, 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 the cutting up of the Middle East into what it is now, is saying, none of those states are legitimate. It's all, they're all nonsense. <clears throat> Nor geography keep us apart so that every Muslim country is our country. Their lands are also our lands. Al-Murkin's manual, as I said, was used in the terrorist campaign in Saudi Arabia and in Yemen today. The strategic companion piece to this work is Abu Bakr Naji's 2004, The Administration of Savagery, which is a st strategic roadmap of Al Qaeda's insurgency in Yemen today. And why am I saying that as an analysis? No, they said it was. And they said, if you don't believe it, look at what we do and read the book and see if we're not following it. In it, Naji describes, um, <coughs> after, after analyzing the Ottoman Empire's fall, describes how to learn to play the political game, how to set up and administer Islamic emirates within areas of, within areas of chaos or savagery, as he calls it, in ungoverned lands or in urban settings. And by 2005, Abu Mus'ab al-Suri completed his magnum opus, which was the call to global Islamic res resistance, which is a 1,604-page recipe for how to turn al-Qaeda's hopeless quest into a global struggle of individual terrorists and small units attacking American interests without belonging to a hierarchical, a hierarchical organization. And the, the specific reason for that is because such an organization have, al have always been vulnerable to counterterrorism and police methods. Just this year, Abu Mundur Ash-Shakit and Shankiti uh, wrote on a jihadist website that Salafist jihadists, that is Al-Qaeda, can return to their countries under a new name like Ansar al-Sharia. 
Uh, and their intention might well be to carry out the global fight in separate organizations which do not recognize borders, which can unite later after they are successful locally. In other words, fourth generation warfare. I should mention that all of the works I cite, and hundreds of them, are easily found on the internet today if you know how to, how to, how to find them. I'm told five minutes, but I'm going to read it faster. <laughs> the next decade is likely to be marked by increasingly uh, more decentralized uh, jihadist movements led or influenced by men who had experience with Al-Qaeda, perhaps, but will invent other names for themselves. Uh, they are ideologically uh, opposed to democracy, of course, and they will seek to find a place in the changed circumstances of Arab Spring countries and will appear wherever a country is on the brink of becoming a failed state. They will be united by ideology, but not by organization. Uh, they reject the prevailing world order along with democracy. They may call themselves Ansar as Sharia, which is a perfectly fine name, uh, as in Eastern Libya or South Yemen, or use some other name to complicate the picture for counter-terrorist programs. They will try to be multidimensional, like the Muslim Brotherhood that they hate. Uh, but their core will still be violent jihadist ideology and strategy. They may become more dangerous if the United States, weary of the issue, turns a blind eye to what may seem merely regional security issues or this or that radical group. The situation could be more dangerous if countries allow citizens to travel to insurgencies where they get training, even if it's a good cause like Syria. Uh, some of those who volunteer will no doubt be jihadist in orientation and could pose serious problems when they return. So what should the United States do? First, I guess I'm just an echo here, we should avoid long-term deployments of large contingencies of conventional forces to the region. This was what al-Qaeda strategists claimed they wanted us to do in the first place, because they know that as part of the psychological political war that they're fighting, that's the best strategy for them to, to, to goad us into overreacting. Counterterrorism should be the response uh, to jihadist attacks on American citizens or interests. Uh, Roby mentioned this, I totally agree. But knowledge is most important. Setting aside our concentration on Al-Qaeda Central, we should prioritize research and analysis of jihadist groups, and I make the distinction between Islamists and jihadists. We can analyze them by the five requirements for a jihadist group. I mean, there's just one way. First, this is what they say they need to, to function. A manhaj, which is a program or methodology. That is, how would they apply their belief structure to society? So that's a, a little, you know, look at these guys and what are they going to do when they, get, they say they're going to do. Um, second is leadership. Who are they? What are their connections to other forces hostile to democracy in the United States or just good governance? Third, mukhata, strategy. Are they following a recognizable Al-Qaeda pattern? Fourth, thumb wheel funding, Where, what are their sources? North Africa, it's, you know, it, it can be, it can be uh, kidnapping uh, and therefore just criminal activity, or it could be individuals in the Gulf. And fifth, Baya, or an oath of allegiance, is it to a local individual or is it also to an external group? Unless the intelligence agencies, police forces, collect against these and similar criteria, we're setting ourselves up for further strategic surprises. In addition, universities and research centers are perhaps better uh, able to analyze the same phenomenon. The United States government should continue to make seized documents widely available to uh, Before I turn this over to the audience, and, and in some ways, um, I think Mike has answered this, but you know, one of the places that the rubber hits the road here is uh, the difference between uh, electoral democracy, voting, and, and what Zakaria calls constitutional liberalism, or the institutions and, and the things that make sort of the <coughs> liberties that, that we take for granted uh, uh, possible. And, and Roby didn't argue that we should muddle through. He simply said that we probably would muddle through. And all three of our speakers have, have, have discussed um, uh, reforms to avoid the, the, the sorts of strategic surprises that we've seen. And so I, I'd like to ask a, a real brief sort of two-part question that says, uh, first of all, uh, what, what sorts of reforms lead to the institutional changes that we need to see for democracy to take root? Uh, and, and this assumes it's, it's possible in this part of the world. I think it is, but it assumes it is. 
Uh, so what sorts of reforms? And to, I, I guess this is just, just one part of the question. And, uh, to avoid uh, strategic surprises such as fourth generation warfare um, uh, uh, and even the Arab Spring Revolution? Well, I'm going to tread on a little thin ice here. I don't like the D word, democracy. Because when we use democracy, we're not even a democracy, people. We're a republic. Okay? If you don't believe it, look at the Electoral College. Okay? Uh, so what I believe in is representative government. In other words, if you don't have a system of government where the major factions in the society feel like they have somebody representing their interests, okay, feel like that there is some recourse, feel like they're not trapped at the bottom of a, some cesspool somewhere, then you have the potential for explosion. I think the reason that you haven't had the explosion in the monarchies is because the monarchies are so divided and the interests are so divided among the elements in the monarchies that there is a feeling at a very broad level within most of the monarchies that they are represented. The one exception is Bahrain, and that's because you've got 60% of the population is uh, Shia, and, and uh, the other 40% is Sunni somehow supporting the government. So I think the issue is representative government and feeling like you have an alternative and you can move forward. I also, so, when you talk about institutions, and monarchy has been far more durable, every one of the current ruling families in the Gulf came to power 250 years ago and they're still there. I don't know how much more durable you want, want to see. And if you start changing that, suddenly going to one man, one vote, then you're asking for a can of worms to open up because then it could fracture back to what we're seeing in Syria, clan, sectarian, you go down the list, whatever, uh, groups going at each other's throats. That, that is the problem with Iraq, with Syria, with Lebanon, to a lesser degree with Palestine and Israel because you basically got two different sectarian groups or three or four living there. Egypt fits more the model of the classic national state and has for 5,000 years. They've got a good history there. Uh, Tunisia is very isolated, very small up the course. Libya is another fractured thing. It's an artificial creation of a after the colonial, uh, after colonial rule where they took three disparate parts, stuck them together and called it a country, okay, under the Idrisi. So I guess my reaction is I'm not surprised. Arab Spring doesn't surprise me. There's no mechanism for transfer of power in the Arab republics. Egypt had a revolution in 1952, and there was never an, a uh, constitutional transfer of power after that date. In other words, they removed Naguib, the general, in 54, and Nasser took over. Nasser died, Sadat take over, and Sadat dies, uh, Mubarak takes over. So why should anyone believe there was the potential to move forward with a, with a uh, transition of power uh, uh, through in, an institutional transition of power. So I think that really what this represents more is an almost, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with Ibn Khaldun, the, uh, the uh, Arab philosopher of the 14th century, it more uh, represents this thesis antithesis. When the pain, the economic pain and the suffering get to a certain point, you have an eruption, okay? The key is going to be what happens under Morsi in Egypt and, uh, and the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, whether they can really institutionalize change, and uh, that remains to be seen. I think he's going to have to get more, but I guess my reaction is, I, didn't, I don't see that as a surprise. It's not, it's not if it's going to happen or erupt, it's when it erupts, particularly in the republics. In the monarchies, they've kind of gotten control of it. And it is a system that has worked fairly well over the years. And I'll go back to my other statement. You look at their record on human rights. I don't care what they did. There is no comparison to the way Saddam Hussein or the Assads. I, I had to sit in Amman and watch uh, uh, Hafez al-Assad slaughter 30,000 people in Hama in 1982. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, that turns my stomach, okay? But for us to get involved in that and try to straighten it out, how did that work in Iraq? How did it work in Afghanistan? We can't fix their problems. They have to fix their problems. And if we can help on the margins, we ought to do it. 
Well, I'm afraid we may learn some wrong lessons out of our, particularly out of our recent experiences. Uh, when we talk about can we affect change, can we affect, okay, call it democratic change, if you will, but can we, can we improve these countries in a way that they want to change? Uh, I think it's too easy sometimes to just assume that because we want it, uh, it's probably our values imposed upon them. Uh, I don't think that's the case. What has happened is we have gone about trying to make changes and perhaps have not done it in, in a fashion uh, that, was, uh, was, that was going to be productive. But there, we do have a role to play. Uh, I don't think we can avoid it because to say that we can, um, Roby, just to be at the, at the margins, at the distant margins, uh, I'm afraid is, uh, is ceding that because others will take a, a, try to shape if we don't. I think we have to be in there. I think our values have to be known, even if we have to modulate the way in which we try to, to convince people that this is the way to go. Uh, I, I don't see, for example, for the Afghans, I don't see the Afghans, as some people do, as some tribal group whose whole mentality is just so different than ours. Their likes and their dislikes are not different from ours. They've had different historical experiences. Yes, they do have different rules that they go by. But when it gets down to, for example, uh, democracy, if we define democracy as people wanting to affect change, have their demands heard, and hold, and hold their leaders responsible, the Afghans are right there. Now, they may not want to or necessarily have to do it through a parliamentary system. There are other ways in which we can support. Uh, what I'm saying is I fear that we will develop in this process, we will disengage because of, uh, of particularly because of recent experiences, we will disengage where it's in their interests as well as our interests, that we continue to be a presence uh, what kind of presence we are, that's, you know, that's difficult. And we've learned some lessons about what not to do. And we've heard a lot of that this morning, for example, the sorts of things not to do. Uh, but uh, at times, uh, uh, we, we do have that responsibility. And so uh, uh, I, I, I just think we're going to have to recognize that. Um. Well, I think, I think that uh, the problem with, with, uh, with reforms is it, it, if we think ver in very broad, high, big terms, you know, uh, from, from lack of, of representative government to representative government, all we can do is make speeches about that, and, and you only get so far, and, and the issues of hypocrisy come up right away. But there are reforms, and I, when I was in the Millennium Challenge Corporation that we, we discovered, if you, if you think somewhat at the more micro level, and that you, you take, uh, you, you know, you seek, you consult with people in sectors uh, what they think they need to do a better job. Let's say with business. Everybody wants to do business. Uh, you know, I'm not a businessman, but, you know, everybody wants to do business. You know, it, it's not, that's not a problem. But how do you do that? You know, how do you create a, a level playing field? Not that we are the best in the world, but we have things like, for instance, we know how to reform tariff rules or, you know, tax rules, how to keep records. Um, and and there, there are technical assistance that we can give if we find out what they think they need. You know, and so instead of trying to go to a political level, we quietly work with those people who are reform-minded and try to work on the reforms that they think they need and give them advice when they ask for it, but give them technical assistance. And mainly help train and educate their folks so they can do it for themselves. Because if we design the answer, it's not their answer and they don't own it. Um, if we um, uh, basically 
uh, give everybody a pump for their well, um, they don't own it. We own it. You know, if, if, they're, if, they're, if it's, it's the pump that belongs to USAID, it's, it's, it's not their pump. But if we manage to get it so it's on the market and they, and, and they can buy the pump and own it, and a village can own it, the village now owns the pump, they own it, they run it, they take care of it, and they don't, they don't let others in the village hurt it. In other words, it's got to be their idea. So the reforms need to be, in my level, small gauge, fit to what people need, their ideas. Uh, I think I talk, probably talked too much about strategic surprise. I think knowledge, I think the, our problem is that, that w since when we don't understand something, we paint it. So I use the term, like, for instance, just one, one example, I use the term Salafist jihadism. And so um, uh, that is an attempt by Al-Qaeda to take advantage of a very vibrant, um, austere uh, religious movement in the Muslim world writ large whether you like it or you dislike it. it it's not Al-Qaeda, it's something else. And so when they tack the word jihadism on it, what, what they're doing is they are automatically changing it. You know, mo the Salafists in Egypt, you know, to everybody's surprise, I don't know why, but you know, they hadn't been in elections before because they couldn't, then suddenly they joined the elections. That is absolutely wrong. And so from an Al-Qaeda point of view, so they were still very, they had still a Salafist view, but they weren't. They were. They were now as far as they could be from Al Qaeda. We took. We'll take it. It's. It's easy for us to say. Okay, it's Salafist. So there. It's all, for. It's all bad. It's not true. It's just wrong. But we don't know it because we don't know enough. So knowledge. Uh, General Hayden, who is an ex uh, director of former director of CIA and NSA and a, and a four star general and a very smart but no nonsense guy. He talked about the deep battle and the close battle, and what he he said is that. Essentially, um, for the deep battle, universities and researchers, uh, research groups and analytical groups can do a better job in government because uh, if, 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 a, if a public official with four silver stars on his, on his shoulder uh, stands up and starts talking about Islam, he said, it just turns to ashes in my mouth or any sentence with Islam or Islamic in it, you know, it'll have the opposite effect of anything I intended, I'll be misinterpreted, it just doesn't work. And anyway, I never have the time to study it enough to know. But universities, collaborative groups, research, they can do this. And so I, I always encourage, you know, I thought one of the greatest things that, that, that the government did was let a lot of these documents uh, free for those people who can read it. And then you learn languages. You know, Americans um, know one language, sort of. Um, you know, <laughs> you got to learn languages, and you've got because I assure you, if you go on the on, and I love I love West Point site and their Center for Studying Terrorism. But if you go and you read the translations, you will find that there's something about gang warfare going on because the the term uh, they use asabat. Uh, you know, it 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 mean, You know, it has lots of meanings that. And, and Ibn Khaldun talked about asabiya uh, in a tribal context, and it can mean gangs. But it's used as a technical term of art you know, for guerrilla warfare uh, by Al Qaeda and all these guys. So, so when they have that in documents, if you know, that's what it means. It doesn't mean something else. Um, you know, and, and when you see war of the oppressed, well, their actual, the actual words they use are, it's not oppressed, it's those thought to be weak but aren't really, and it's taken from a Quranic term in, and it's used five times in the Quran to mean those, you could interpret it as the oppressed, those deemed to be weak and are treated by their oppressors as being weak, but they're strong because they have you know, Allah in their hearts. You know, all that's lost in the translations. You really got to, you know, you've got to do the effort to get students who can interpret this and the more people that know the languages, the better, uh, and so that's strategic surprise. The way to get out of st strategic surprise is a granulated knowledge of what the world is like and who and the peoples in the world that we're dealing with. And there's no better counter narrative to all of the Al Qaeda nonsense than a vibrant American Muslim community that's integrated into our society that we don't brag about because they just stand for themselves. They can brag about themselves. When I was in Canada, I, I, I met, uh, we was at a conference, I met with some Muslim uh, groups in Canada and they were saying they really, uh, they, 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 they were very involved in 
a Canadian, I'm just taking their word for it because I don't know Canadian politics. They were involved in Canadian uh, politics. They were very politically active, but they weren't integrated into the economy. And they say, we envy the Muslim community in the United States because it's totally integrated into the economy. They aren't so, so politically active yet, but, you know, but they've got the basis and we're just asking for jobs and, and, and ability to do a business. So, you know, the counter narrative is not, uh, we should do not by words, but by deeds. What we do is a better argument for the world that our model might be something that's worth following rather than a thousand speeches by people because you know speeches are beautiful uh, and they're inspiring and they're necessary but on Monday morning after your after your Sunday speech what are you doing to accomplish what you said you wanted to do thank you thank you uh, the questions from the audience are you guys really that hungry Gina experience from a family that is both Christian and Muslim, you cannot understate what you have said about honor and understanding differences. Um, my question is one that addresses the future of policy, though. Uh, in, in, we, in this particular panel, we talked about the, the effects of the, the psychological warfare of Al-Qaeda, pushing us into this, or convincing us to go with arms into the Middle East. This has been turned around by our government as a, a war for bringing democracy to the Middle East. And as a Latin Americanist, I want to bring up a point that is troubling to me because, as you said in your presentation, we don't always like what democracy brings as a result. And, and I look back on the last half of the, the 20th century in Latin America <coughs> and see the, in the 1950s, our overthrowing a democratically elected government in Guatemala, Paco Morales. I look at the, ironically, on 9-11, uh, uh, 1973, participating in the overthrow of the Chilean government, Salvador Allende. I look at a long-term supported war against the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. I see all of these happening, and I wonder what our response is going to be when these democratic governments, or as you would maybe prefer to term them, government representations of people and their desires come to power. And some people have even pointed out, I think there's a, a very controversial book, The Empire's Workshop, that perhaps Latin America was a, an experience for how we're going to work in the Middle East in the future. Is anyone thinking about the uh, the difference, these cultural differences that will not respond to the hegemony of the United States and their presence and our reaction to their new governments. Are we thinking about what we have done in Latin America over the last century and what the results have been? And is that going to be a guide to help us with the reception or receiving these new governments? What have we learned, and how are we going to react to these groups? Based on, and I think of what Chase Untermeyer said yesterday, our foreign policy really doesn't change that much. And so I'm, I'm concerned about the very <clears throat> spring. Um, here's what I would say, is um, when you look at foreign policy and look at the way we react to things, what we've got to keep ourselves from doing is blatantly silly things and uh, and then when we make a mistake not recognizing it look we're the biggest country in the world we got the biggest economy by some margin militarily we're more powerful than everybody else around and so our potential to do a lot of damage and do something stupid is magnified by that okay right and we are going to do something from time to time that you wonder what in the world we were thinking when, when we do it, right? And so part of it is recognizing that. My, my biggest heartburn with the neocons, uh, I like to say that neocon uh, philosophy and uh, U.S. foreign policy is part of the American progressive tradition. It's the worst of Woodrow Wilson's faith in democracy and the worst of Teddy Roosevelt's big stick without the sophistication or the nuance of either person. 
Uh, but, but, so, but, but you like it otherwise. Right? Yeah, other than that, I like it. Uh, and, and here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying we don't go after the people we need to go after. I've been doing that for 35 years. Okay? I, I, I mean, I've done things that I doubt anybody in this room has done. Okay? Go, you go after the people you need to get, but it's less is more. Going in and take, trying to take over and show everybody how to do it. Turning it in, I, I had a senior colonel tell me about Afghanistan that he knew we were in deep trouble. It wasn't that they set up a PX at Bagram Air Base. It was when they started drawing lines on the parking lot and issuing parking tickets. <laughs> he said, we Americanized the war. In other words, we became the issue because of the, because of the presence. Do you see what I'm saying? And when I say it's a special ops war, that goes beyond just kinetically coming out of the night in a black helicopter and ruining somebody's evening, okay? That means you've got to be thinking about civil affairs, you've got to be thinking about, you've got to be thinking about the cultural situation in which it, in which it uh, falls. You've got to be thinking about the fact that, well, for example, the Afghan government's bringing troops from the north down to police Kandahar, and they fundamentally hate each other, but the reason they want to is more about control from Kabul than it is creating some kind of stability down there. So, I think we're thinking about those things. I, I do get concerned that in elections, um, it's like sanity goes out the window when people's trying to, you know, people are desperately trying to get an advantage in an election, okay? And, and it, would probably, it would probably write itself after the election, but you never quite know whether that will happen or not. So um, I think that what we need to pursue, and when I say we need to take a more distant role, we cannot win these conflicts in the, con in the way that we won World War II, okay? We learned that in Vietnam. I don't know why we have to relearn it again, okay? But what we can do is we can influence how it turns out by pressing on the scales. Sometimes winning means the other guys didn't win either, right? You don't have a jihadist state, a state that's harboring jihadists like Afghanistan was. Uh, so, I think you see us moving forward along that plane of a lower, lower visibility. Uh, and at the same time, I think we're very much engaged, okay? But we can't fix it. We can't come in and say, Americans are terrible about this. We're, we can't help it, it's in our DNA. We come in and we say, you need to do it our way. Okay, this just doesn't work right. I feel that way about I won't say it. I'm from Dallas. I'm in Houston, so I'm going to be you, whatever. Uh, but, uh, okay, uh, but I'm saying that I think we're getting, I think we've learned a set of lessons. What upsets me is that we should, we should have to relearn them on, uh, we shouldn't have to relearn them on a, uh, on a regular basis. We shouldn't have to relearn them on a basis. And i got to say, Michael, Michael's hit on this, but I want to really hammer it. You hear some guy using a term salapis, or another guy using a term jihadist, or another guy using a term ikhtihad, and another guy using uh, Muslim fundamentalist, or using a term Muslim brotherhood, and they're all doing it, mixing it in with Al-Qaeda and everything else, okay? That is insane ignorance. You need to take a hard look at exactly what those terms mean and what those terms mean in a specific situation. Because it is where we are getting killed is in the granularity, understanding the granularity of the problem. What Michael's saying is that deep battle being able to go after it. And so I, I feel like we've learned another lesson. I feel like leading from behind, whatever they want to call that, is nonsense invented. I don't know who said it. If the administration said it, they shouldn't have. It was probably invented by the media. I think what we call it is a um, is more of a low key, less is more approach, and I think we'll have more influence, et cetera. Take Iraq out of the equation in the region. Take our attempt to fix Iraq and turn it into a democracy out of the equation in the region, and the six thousand dead and everything flows with that. What kind of situation would we be in right now? Okay, I think we would be infinitely stronger. Yeah. The Iranians stopped their nuclear program in 2003 because they were afraid of what was going to happen next. 
after they saw us get bogged down and unable to do anything about it, with all sides taking shot, they said, we don't have to be afraid of these guys. The situation we're in now is standing squarely between lunch and oh, everybody else. So uh, we'll adjourn to the room next door.